Now, it seems to me, as a, uh, an historian, among other things, of Britain, British national condition, that nothing unites the British when they want to cheer themselves up quite so much as a good moan. We moan about the weather, especially when it's rather good at the moment, very unseasonably warm, isn't it, this, this autumn. We moan about our neighbours, our immediate neighbours, who may be too noisy or too quiet behind the privet hedges. We moan about other countries and other peoples who unaccountably don't seem to be able to uh, speak English. And for quite a lot of British history, an awful lot of Brits have been moaning about London. This moaning starts early in the Elizabethan age when London's too big, it's too noisy, it's consuming too many resources. By the 18th century, early 19th century, um, Cobden and others were moaning about the way in which London was corrupt, luxurious and extravagant in its ways. In the 19th century, for Dickens among others, great chronicler of London life, but nonetheless he saw it as a kind of Babylon, making too much money, too much noise. And the moaning has carried on, and an awful lot of Londoners themselves have sometimes moaned about the other city the city of London. And it's the relationship between the city of London and the capital city of London that is the subject matter of this evening's History of Capitalism lecture, which is being delivered by Anne Murphy, who has come to us this evening from the University of Hertfordshire. Anne has a back catalogue that is highly significant. She is, but don't say this too loudly, she is a former trader in derivatives. Significant person, therefore, herself in the history of the City of London. In this lecture, which is the last of this year's um, series of lectures on the history of capitalism and the last of the introductory three-year syllabus, we're going to go on to considering the history of banking next year as part of capitalism. Um, and therefore, we have got an unusual degree of authority here this evening, somebody who's actually practiced something that she's writing about. Always a good thing in an historian, Delighted to have Anne with us here this evening. She's going to talk about a riot to begin with. And I know that your reception for her will be equally riotous. Thank you very much indeed. Anne Murphy. Good evening. Um, thank you all for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, as per the introduction, I'm going to talk about the Bank of England, mainly in the 18th century, a little bit in the 19th century. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is uh, the bank, its relationship with London, um, and also a little bit about why I think it is one of the key institutions, one of the most important institutions in understanding economic development in the 18th century. Um, but we start with a riot. So, on the night of the 7th of June, 1780, rioters made a number of attempts to storm the Bank of England. And their failure was no reflection of a lack of numbers or a lack of passion, but rather the strength of the defence force that turned out to protect the institution. That force included a troop of horse and foot guards, the Northumberland Militia, the Voluntary London Military Association, willing volunteers from the general public, including John Wilkes, the radical journalist and politician, uh, and the bank's clerks itself. Indeed, the bank's clerks apparently melted down the inkstands from their desks to make more bullets for their guns. Now, sadly, this is probably just a legend. The bank, in fact, had uh, quite a significant armory uh, that it kept very well stocked uh, against just this sort of event. So it probably wouldn't have had to go melting down the inkstands in order to make more bullets. Um, it was nonetheless, thanks to the efforts of the bank staff, 
the protection of men like Wilkes and the foot guards who apparently kept up a constant fire dispersing the rioters that the bank remained safe and indeed opened for business the very next day. It was a reduced business but they did indeed open for business. Now at first sight the bank was not an obvious target for this mob. Their actions actually originated in Lord George Gordon's invectives against Catholicism and in particular the presentation on the 2nd of June of a petition to the House of Commons calling for the dissolution of the 1778 Act by which some of the disabilities against Roman Catholics had been removed. Uh, on that day, a crowd of some 60,000 people gathered in St. George's Fields in Southwark to hear Gordon speak and join the march on Parliament to present a, uh, a Protestant petition. The crowd contained probably some disorderly and probably some criminal elements, uh, but was comprised also of well-dressed and decent sort of people. Once at Westminster, it made its presence felt. Uh, Westminster Hall was invaded, the court of the King's Bench was forced to adjourn, peers were attacked on their way to Parliament. Gordon succeeded in getting the House to consider his petitions um, and made periodical and inflammatory reports on the debate to the waiting crowd. His actions, of course, all but ensured that when the petition was rejected, the mob would become violent. Their initial targets uh, were chapels, properties used and owned by Catholics, uh, but surrounding properties were damaged in the confusion. And as the week went on, the rioters turned their attention to symbols of authority as well. Uh, these included prisons, the houses of magistrates. Um, on the 7th of June, a day dubbed Black Wednesday by Horace Walpole, the rioters targeted shops, businesses, offices, schoolhouses, and as the night drew on, the tolls on Blackfriars Bridge were destroyed and further attacks were made on London's prisons. The climax to the day was the ill-fated attacks on the bank itself. Now, we can't spend too much time investigating the motivations of this crowd, but it's clear that these rioters were spurred on by more than just rumours that the bank contained a quantity of popish money. Arguably, since the bank was regularly active in the courts as it sought to protect both its business and the financial system against the activities of coiners and forgers, it was itself viewed as a symbol of authority and repression. Historians also acknowledge a strong class bias in the attacks on Catholics and other targets. In this respect, perhaps the bank was a more natural target. It had for a long time been the focus of resentment among those of London's middling sort who were losing ground to the moneyed men, the financiers, supposedly making their fortunes in the financial markets. The bank had also attracted the ire of a broader section of society who suffered the burden of taxation that resulted from the wars of the period. Also, while it's certainly going far too far to suggest that the mob understood that whoever is the master of the bank and the tower will soon become the master of the city, and whoever is the master of the city will soon become the master of Great Britain, the rioters must also have seen the bank as a strong symbol of political and economic power. The attacks on the bank then were not just an anomaly in a set of actions more properly directed at the symbols of straight state repression. The bank was, in fact, a legitimate target for the mob. Fortunately for our story, of course, it was also seen as worthy of protection. And what I would like to do uh, in what follows is to think a little bit about how the bank became worthy of such protection. How did a hastily constructed temporary solution to the funding of a late 17th century war turn into the great engine of state, a symbol of oppression to some, but a symbol of trust, solidity, and British geopolitical power to others? So let's start by returning to the late 17th century, 
uh, a time of significant political and economic change. It was also a time when there was actually much support for the idea of a public bank. There were relatively few banks in Britain at this point. We're talking the 1680s, 1690s. Um, and those that there were were small, limited in scope. But some projectors looked overseas and were impressed by what they saw as the advantages conferred by larger public banks in places like Venice, Genoa, and perhaps most specifically uh, for the British uh, in Amsterdam. They argued that a public bank along such lines was necessary to regulate and stimulate the British economy. William Patterson, who was one of the Bank of England's founders, uh, not the most important of the Bank of England's founders, he's the one that's always cited, but actually Michael Godfrey, I think, who was the other of the bank's founders, was much more important. But William Patterson said that a public bank was needed for the convenience and security of great payments, and the better to facilitate the circulation of money, creation of credit. He went on to say that the bank would bring down the rate of interest and to increase the availability of capital. And here he's, what he's referring to is the rivalries with neighbours, and particularly uh, with the Netherlands, the Low Countries, um, and thinking about how Britain could become more prosperous. And the way that Britain could become more prosperous was to have a bank that would generate credit. Not everybody, though, was in favour of creating such an institution. Important questions were raised about its potential relationship with the Crown. This, of course, was a particular concern following the Glorious Revolution of 1688, when the English Parliament had gained greater powers. It used those powers to impose a restrictive financial settlement on William III uh, that was intended to ensure his continuing dependence on Parliament. And it was argued that a public bank might be used by the monarch uh, to circumvent Parliament's control. Although these arguments are interesting and they do provide the context to what the discussions of a public bank might be and might do, the Bank of England wasn't really a response to any of these points. It was quite simply a product of war. The glorious revolution that deposed the Catholic James II and brought Dutch William and his wife Mary, James's daughter, to the throne um, created almost immediate conflict. Although William had been invited to England for the presentation of Protestantism at home, the new king had larger ambitions in mind. He wanted to check the power of Louis XIV's France, and thus one of his first acts was to take Britain into a European war. The Nine Years' War raged from 1689 to 1697. It was indecisive and it was expensive, very expensive. Public spending rose from under £2 million per annum to over £6 million a year. Um, and everybody's sitting there thinking, well, the government would be very pleased with £6 million a year in public spending. Uh, but for William III, there was a, this was a lot of money to raise. Where did the money come from? Well, at first it was raised uh, in short-term borrowing, increased taxation, um, and it was facilitated by funds raised from a few rich individuals or by paying contractors in IOUs rather than in cash. By 1692, though, for a war that started in 1689, uh, the funds were running dry, as was the collective patience of uh, the government's creditors. Um, nobody wanted to keep lending. So new solutions had to be sought. And what they needed to do was to figure out ways of raising much more money from many, many, many more people and paying it back over the long term rather than the short term. Uh, the innovations which they come up with are summarised, and I hope you can see them there um, in this table here. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting things. Uh, perhaps the most interesting is the Million Adventure Lottery. 
uh, the first state lottery, if you like. Uh, they sold £10 tickets and you could win a prize of up to £1,000 a year for a period of 16 years. The real innovation on this lottery is that everybody got their money back. So it was very popular. The interesting thing also was that you could split tickets. So you could put together syndicates to buy them, which meant that an awful lot of relatively ordinary people uh, were buying lottery tickets. This was very popular, it went down very well. The Tontine loan, which is incredibly complicated and nobody understood it, didn't go down very well at all. If we judge by longevity, the Bank of England was perhaps one of the most successful of the innovations of the 1690s. And it appeared a success at the start of its life. Uh, in, it was in April 1694 that the promoters of the bank were granted the right to set it up. Uh, they were offered the right to raise £1.2 million. The subscription was open to all, uh, natives and foreigners, bodies public and corporate. The subscription books were open on the 21st of June 1694 and they were filled 12 days later. So people rushed to this opportunity. One of the reasons, of course, they rushed to this opportunity was that the bank was apparently going to pay 8% interest. Uh, so it looked like a very good deal. By the 2nd of July, the full amount had been subscribed. Uh, 1,268 individuals uh, started off by the king and queen, including uh, about 13, 14% women, uh, carpenters, relatively ordinary people. Uh, some subscribed, started at 10,000 pounds, went all the way down uh, to 25 pounds. By early August, after having raised the money by the start of July, by early August, the bank had opened its doors to new business. If you can imagine that, a new bank established, funded and opened in just a matter of weeks. Um, yet in spite of the enthusiasm of the subscribers and the prompt fulfilment of its promises to the state, the Bank of England may, remained a temporary measure. It was created to raise that £1.2 million to essentially lend it straight away to the state for the funding of its war. Um, but its impermanence was enshrined in its first charter. Its first charter was granted it for just a period of 12 years. It was supposed to be closed down with one year's notice uh, on the 1st of August 1705. This was no brave new world. This was a sticking plaster uh, for a wound that was expected to heal quickly. And the bank was to remain vulnerable throughout much of the early 18th century, uh, beset by potential rival schemes such as the proposed land bank and, of course, the much more threatening South Sea Company. Um, it lived in a borrowed home until 1734, so for the first 40 years of its life, it didn't even dare to establish itself uh, in a permanent home. Moreover, while the bank served the state, its relationship with Parliament was not always easy. And, and I think this is important. We shouldn't assume because of the bank's longevity that it achieved security quickly. It did not. Its charter was subject to periodic renewals well into the 19th century. And it took many years for the bank to establish its reputation and secure its place in the heart of Britain's finances. It also had internal struggles about what its role might be. What secured the bank's position? What ensured that it would survive uh, uh, when the other key companies of the 17th and 18th century, the East India Company and the South Sea Company, were altered, changed, wound up? Well, I think figure one, um, this chart here, tells us uh, what, um, what created the bank. And it was the costs of war. So what you see here is the rising levels of public debt uh, throughout the 18th century. And each blip up is a war. Uh, so in the 1750s, uh, the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 73, you can see a blip up in debt. <coughs> Uh, the American Revolution, and then at the end, the wars against revolutionary and Napoleonic France. 
When not fighting, resources were employed in preparing for war. Moreover, this, the cost of sustained conflict uh, was immense. By 1819, the total unredeemed capital of the public debt stood at a little over £844 million. Pounds. Now, this was a staggering sum for an industrialising nation. And Britain's ability to sustain such a high burden of debt without descending uh, too far into economic and political chaos demonstrates the effectiveness of the system of state finance and how much the British war machine owed to the willingness of investors to invest, to lend to their government. And this is where the bank's primary purpose lay throughout the 18th century. This, I think, is why it survived. Its management of the system of state debt, its role as banker to the state, and its role particularly, and I think this is particularly important, as mediator between the state and the public creditors, between the state and the people who lent it money. Um, it's through these tasks that the bank made the majority of its profits on what it built its reputation and where it saw its own purpose. The consequences of all of this were not just a proficiency in the practicalities of managing the national debt. That certainly came, and if you glance through any of the bank's ledgers, uh, what you'll see is that they were beautifully kept. They're absolutely meticulous in their record keeping, uh, very few mistakes. And given the scale of work, which we'll talk about in a minute, that was no small achievement. Um, but the nature and the scale of the work uh, undertaken by the bank also meant that over the course of the 18th century, it became embedded in public life and in the life of the city. If we look at some of the bank's records, and thankfully the bank has managed to preserve most of its records, uh, the advantage, I think, of being on the same site uh, for so long, and also a system of hiding things away in a library, which apparently in the 18th century nobody wanted to go into because it was too dark, uh, damp and unpleasant. Uh, so you can see in the records that this place is full. It's, there are crowds. It's also embedded in the rhythms of the city. And you can see a very sort of rhythm, a set of rhythms to life uh, in the city during the 18th century. Uh, the clerks who reported to an audit in 1783 said that the stockbrokers come in at a certain time to do their business. The people, when they come uh, to collect their dividends, they come in uh, at certain times. The bankers come in in the evening to cash their notes and to do their business. Uh, and we lay on extra, the bank said it laid on extra staff at those times to make sure uh, that that work was facilitated. Uh, there are hints that the crowds were so large at the bank at certain times during the day uh, that thieves and prostitutes found it a good place to ply their trade. Uh, the sources mention uh, frequent mentions of thieves operating. Uh, in uh, six, 1783, uh, a pickpocket robbed a lady of 30 guineas. Uh, there's a nice old Bailey uh, case uh, where a stockbroker was robbed of his silk handkerchief. I suppose we can be grateful he wasn't robbed of anything else. The frequent mentions of crowds then shouldn't surprise us because the scale of business managed by the late 18th century was absolutely staggering. The issue of 4% annuities uh, during the War of American Independence resulted in the need to open 19,500 new accounts in one day. Uh, around the same time, it was estimated that uh, the work of compiling the list of unpaid dividends for the Exchequer was so time-consuming that it could take five to six months to do this. Uh, compiling the general ledger took pretty much the nine months uh, from one year to the next. So they would spend the time uh, every, every year compiling the general ledger, uh, and then they would pretty much start again uh, almost immediately. Um, all estimates that the clerks give us of the scale of work they were doing emphasise the need for speed uh, and efficiency and emphasise how much work they're doing. 
There's even essentially a two-shift working day at the bank uh, from the 18th century. So there's a business day that operates from around 9 in the morning to about 4 or 5 in the evening. And then there's an evening shift of clerks who come in essentially to update the records to make sure that they are um, fully updated for the next day. Uh, so the bank is working from first thing in the morning, probably from about 7 or 8 in the morning, all the way through to 10, sometimes 11 o'clock in the evening to make sure all of the records are updated. As the, bank, as the business grew, so did the bank itself. Uh, it started with a staff of just 17 uh, in, se in 1694. The number of clerks had expanded to over 100 by the mid-18th century, more than 300 by the 1780s, and over 900 in 1815. This is business on a large scale. The space that the bank occupied naturally expanded as the number of its staff grew. Its first permanent home was in Threadneedle Street, um, the site on which it now stands. Uh, the house had belonged to Sir John Hublon, the first governor, uh, who left uh, his house to the bank in his will. But the house was surrounded by other buildings. Uh, there was also a church on one side of the bank as well, St Christopher Le Stocks. And the bank's directors took a number of measures during the mid to late 18th century to buy up all of this property, all the surrounding buildings and land. In doing so, they made much of the need to enlarge the streets and passages around Threadneedle Street, making them more commodious for visitors and customers. When this issue was raised again in the 1760s, though, the risk of fire was also observed, uh, and also not just the risk to buildings, but the risk to the papers and property that were contained within the bank as well. Um, the bank's fire precautions are abs uh, absolutely fascinating. So they have their own fire engines uh, throughout the 18th century. Uh, they uh, pay the city to make sure the water supply uh, is kept um, uh, at the bank in order to uh, facilitate those fire engines. They also store all of their books every night in wheeled trucks. So there, if there's fire during the night, they could just wheel the trucks out and save the records. But this is because the bank held the only legally binding record uh, of the public debt that the bank managed. Uh, customers were issued with receipts, but that wasn't legally binding. It was the bank's books that recorded your property in the state's debt. So those had to be maintained at all costs. When looking at the way that the bank managed its surrounding area, it managed its bit of London though, I think we can conclude that it was a predator. It was aggressive in its control of its surroundings. Eventually it bought up the whole block. It destroyed St Christopher Le Stocks Church. It pushed out the residents of the area. In doing so though, of course, it's protecting the public creditors, it's protecting the property of the state, it's protecting the property of the people who are investing in its shares uh, and in the state's debt as well. What did these people see when they went to the bank? How did they experience the bank? How did they experience that protection? What were the messages that these changes in the architecture gave? Well, the architecture of the bank was redolent with strong messages for the public. And it's very clear that when they were designing the new buildings, uh, the directors and the architects were thinking not just about mundane security matters, uh, but also the, the way that the bank was presenting itself. Daniel Abramson, who uh, is the historian of the bank's architecture, argues that the bank uh, was designed along lines that represented corporate virtue uh, and its connections to the state. The classical stone facade of the bank, of course, was an obvious contrast uh, to the high, narrow brick um, and wooden buildings that surrounded it. Uh, because of the need for security, there were no windows on the ground floor level, uh, so passers-by at street level saw essentially a blank facade. Uh, the historical geography in blank, black labels these windowless walls exclusionary. He links them to the bank's aggressive protection of its privileges and its monopoly position. 
Yet while the building may have been in some ways reminiscent of a fortress, it did of course send another clear message to those who used its services. Capital invested here will be safe. The iconography that was used within and outside the building underlined that point and also emphasised the bank's usefulness to the country. Uh, Britannia was used as the bank's symbol right from the start. So Britannia is stamped on everything uh, right from the start. Um, and this sculpture was uh, in the mid-18th century over the entrance to the pay hall. And it's a figure of Britannia pouring out the fruits of commerce uh, from her cornucopia, while also holding the shield and spear which symbolise the defence of the nation. All of this was tied up with security for the bank, but security for the nation as well. And that's arguably what the bank was delivering in its management of the national debt. While the exterior of the bank communicated these messages of security, though, I don't think we can push the fortress analogy too far, because the bank essentially was a public space. By the later part of the 18th century, it had more square foot of public space than private space. And despite the doormen and the porters who were supposed to keep the rabble out, uh, as we've already seen, the crowds came in. Uh, prostitutes, thieves, street sellers, uh, ballad sellers, singers, street performers, all of these people seem to have gathered in the bank, finding crowds uh, that they could ply their wares to uh, or take money from. Once people came within the bank, they saw similar messages. So Britannia was prominent inside the building too. Uh, I went looking for Britannia um, a couple of years ago to see where she was, and she's everywhere. Uh, she's stamped on the bank's ledgers, so every single ledger from the 18th century has Britannia stamped in the middle. She's on all of the notes, uh, she's on the letterheads. Uh, Britannia is everywhere. <laughs> Uh, witnesses, uh, visitors would also witness a set of interiors uh, that were grand, that were decorated not only uh, with Britannia, but also with royal iconography, which is interesting for historians because historians try to link the emergence of the national debt with the rise of Parliament um, and put the bank definitely as kind of Parliament's uh, puppet. Uh, but the bank is also making those links uh, to the monarchy as well and had from 1694 uh, all the way through. The wider point, of course, that is intended here all of the time is that the bank was making a statement of probity and security. And this message is also demonstrated in how the bank's directors thought about their role and the role of the institution that they managed. Again, from the, 18, uh, from the 1783 audit, which is a fantastic document um, that we can learn an awful lot from. Uh, but at the end of this, uh, the people, the directors who uh, did the audit summed up what they thought of the bank. And what they noted was a religious veneration for its glorious fabric and a steady and unremitting attention to its sacred preservation. Uh, they noted the immense importance of the Bank of England, not only to the City of London, in points highly essential to the promotion and extension of its commerce, but also to the nation at large. Uh, London always first, nation second. Uh, to the nation at large as the grand palladium of public credit. We cannot be but thoroughly persuaded that an object so great in itself and so interesting to all ranks of the community must necessarily excite care and solicitude in every breast for the wise administration of its affairs. Uh, can you imagine bankers saying that about their institutions today? Uh, we require religious veneration uh, of our institution, perhaps not. I think this message also was one that not only found approval within the bank, I think in essence, this is what's been say, what is being said uh, in perhaps the most famous image of the bank from the late 18th century, and the one that gave the institution its nickname, the old lady. 
Here we have in James Gilray's portrayal, the bank as an elderly, fragile woman in need of protection from the unwelcome overtures of Pitt the Younger, who is, of course, after her gold reserves rather than her virtue here. But here is the bank, uh, again, in danger, worthy of protection. So, so far I've focused on demonstrating the importance of the bank to the process of establishing the integrity of public credit um, and to its operation of sound finance. I've offered you a picture of Gilray's old lady of Threadneedle Street as a warning to public creditors that their increased scrutiny was warranted and a message to Pitt's government that its actions put not just the bank but the entire edifice of public credit at risk. Yet it wouldn't be true to say that all shared this conviction uh, that the bank had to be protected. Over the course of the 18th century, as you might expect, there were many vocal critics of the bank as well. During the charter renewal of 1781, for example, the bank's very close relationship with the state was deemed problematic. Its monopoly was dangerous. Uh, its control of the public finances was too expensive to maintain. Sir George Savile said that the public had an estate to sell and was selling it too damned cheap. The Whig MP David Hartley also challenged the charter renewal, saying it had a value, it should be offered to the highest bidder, not just given away uh, to the Bank of England. Bring in the competitors they said, let's see if somebody can do a better job here. These views, of course, were coupled with a general feeling, especially in the aftermath of the loss of the American colonies, that public finance had grown uh, particularly corrupt and the men at its heart were making money from the state's bellicose nature and thus encouraged reckless and lengthy wars rather than a prudent husbanding of resources. An equally interesting battleground was another symbol of the connection between bank and state. And this was the issue of the bank guard, the military force that was stationed at the institution following the Gordon riots uh, and actually operated there every night for nearly 200 years. The bank's guard wasn't stopped until 1973. Um, given the occasional complaints that are made about the bank's guard, uh, I do wonder exactly what their purpose was. They don't seem to have been particularly attentive to their duties. Uh, in 1793, for example, a complaint was made when two gentlemen had come into the bank to dine with the guard's officer who'd become abusive, broke bottles and started a fight. Um, not much protection on offer there, perhaps. But it's actually not this sort of behaviour, which seems to have been fairly common, uh, that made the guard a bone of contention in the city, resented by both the city corporation and also the local populace. The guard was resented in part because on their march from Westminster via the busy streets of the Strand, Fleet Street and Cheapside, they went too abreast, jostling the public out of the way. Um, and here in this, uh, this uh, Gilray cartoon, you can see them doing precisely that. Um, I'm not sure that they were quite so aggressive as they look, but here they are trampling uh, the populace, women, uh, men and infants underfoot. This negative view was re reinforced in 1788 when actually one of the bank's guards bayoneted and killed a member of public who was too slow to get out of the way. Uh, the guard in question was arrested and tried for murder but convicted only of common assault uh, because the judge deemed his actions not to have arisen from any preconceived malice. Leaving aside these specific grievances though, uh, Resentment also centred on the mere presence of a military force protecting what was supposed to be a civilian institution. In particular, the Corporation of London considered the guard both unconstitutional and an infringement of the city's ancient privileges. The Lord Mayor and the Court of Aldermen wrote to the bank's directors in 1788 asking for the guard to be replaced with a London militia. The bank's directors weren't sympathetic to this. They replied 
they could not be induced to say that they thought the guard unnecessary, as they had great reason to believe that it was highly approved in foreign countries and there considered a great security to the property of the stockholders, who deemed the guard established from the king's own guards as a greater security than any private guard, and that the majority of the proprietors or the shareholders appeared to be pleased with it. There, it seems, was an end to the argument. Shareholders and public creditors, both domestic and foreign, approved of the guard and it would stay, despite the City of London's objections. Other elements of the bank's policy were also directed at preserving the institution's property and were equally resented. The ruthlessness with which it was perceived to pursue su suspected banknote forgers, for example, uh, was regarded as problematic. This was particularly a problem after 1797, when as a means of protecting its gold reserves, the bank sus uh, suspended the convertibility of its notes. The suspension then uh, results in a proliferation of banknotes, a real sort of uh, an, uh, issue, um, especially of one and two pound banknotes, which were much easier uh, to forge. Uh, and therefore, you get a real upsurge in forgery at this time. Uh, because of the nature of the criminal justice system, though, the bank is not just the victim uh, of this forgery, but also has to become the detective and the prosecutor of the forgers. This, of course, requires a significant operation, uh, not only to manage the note issue, but also to identify forgeries, uh, to detect the forgers themselves, and uh, also to manage the capital prosecution of the forgers. And they were executing or demanding the execution uh, of forgers and sometimes the utterers, the people who were just passing on the notes as well. The response of some to the bank's seeming zeal in the pursuit of forgers is exemplified in George Cruikshank's bank restriction note in which our fragile old lady has been transformed into a baby-eating monster. Um, and I don't know whether you can see particularly well the details. This is a fantastic set of images. Uh, but this is um, in the style of a banknote. Uh, you can see um, this would have been on an ordinary banknote. This is Britannia here. Uh, but you can see her enlarged there, uh, surrounded by skeletons, uh, munching on a baby. Uh, the, the pound sign is made out of a noose. Uh, down the side here, you see leg irons uh, joined together. Uh, you've got uh, men and women hanging. Um, and uh, the note is signed, uh, not by the chief cashier of the bank, uh, by Jack Ketch, uh, an executioner with a notoriously poor aim. Here we're offered then the bank as the bringer of suffering and death in the protection of its interests. The questions I think that are being raised here are about the role of this most complex of organizations, a private company answerable to its shareholders, which viewed itself as the mediator between the state as borrower and the public as lenders, but was still dependent on the state and the taxpayer for its existence and for the chief of its profits. How should this bank behave? What should it contribute? If we return to what was mooted at its original purpose, the circulation of credit, the stimulation of the economy, did it fulfill that promise? Well, arguably, the privileges offered to the Bank of England in return to its service uh, to the state, uh, the privileges that it gained from being banker to the state and manager of the public debt, compromised its purpose. Particularly problematic was the fact that it had been granted a monopoly over joint stock banking in 1708. And despite numerous campaigns, that monopoly was not rescinded until 1826. Up until that point, it did arguably act to retard the growth of a national banking system. The consequence was that by the mid-18th century, when banking in Britain was already more than a century old, 
uh, the provision of banking services was pr still predominantly centred in London, concentrated in London. Uh, Leslie Presnell's seminal work, which actually still is the last word uh, on uh, country banking in Britain, despite the fact that it was written in the, the, 17, uh, in the 1950s, um, suggests that there wasn't even a dozen bankers outside of London uh, by 1750. That grows thereafter, uh, but up until that point, banking services are concentrated in London. We should acknowledge, of course, that that wasn't the whole story. Uh, there is evidence of a vibrant financial services industry that is being generated and emerged out of existing business enterprises. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, one interesting case is that of Drover's banks, uh, which evolved out of the need to finance the cattle trade between South Wales and London. The textile manufacturers of the West Riding of Yorkshire form, I think, a better known example. And Pat Hudson's study found that banking and industry connections formed a framework of trade and credit. Um, and there are many examples of the, the banker industrialist, uh, men who were simultaneously involved in trade, in industrial production, and in the provision of banking services. Um, and the, these latter activities grew uh, from connections to London um, and other parts of the country and permit remittances uh, to be made around the country as well. Also permit uh, deposits to be taken and ploughed back into the non-banking sides of the business. But although admirable and adaptable and innovative, because of its construction and because of the bank's monopoly in part, the financial services sector of the late 18th century and the early 19th century was subject to fairly frequent crises. The relatively small scale of the financial services, service providers meant that they were vulnerable to panics within their customer base and to potential runs on their banking institutions. Localised banking problems could easily spark wider spread crises and banking collapses which impacted on the wider economy. And these problems were impacted, were compounded by the bank's own business agenda, which was very much focused on the provision of services to the state, to the public creditors, and in London. By 1815, it had grown very large, it had grown remarkably efficient, but it didn't need to focus outside of uh, its management of the national debt. It didn't create a branch network until the mid 19th century. And while it did accept a role um, bringing stability to the financial system, its route to becoming uh, a more mature central bank uh, was long and arduous. Perhaps that's hardly a surprise. The Bank of England, of course, had to break new ground. It was the first of its kind to operate in a complex industrialised economy. But that meant that while many in late 18th century and early 19th century society could see the need for a rudder to steer the economy, the bank didn't always volunteer to provide that rudder. So how could we conclude? Did the bank let down the British economy in the late 18th century? Was it too focused on London business? Perhaps. The measures that it took to protect its monopoly and its position arguably had negative consequences outside of London arguably had negative consequences on the development of the financial services industry, arguably had negative consequences on those who fell foul uh, of uh, the forgers and uh, the capital punishment that was imposed upon them. But I think there is also strong evidence to suggest that an efficient, trustworthy system of public debt with the Bank of England at its heart both as manager of that debt, but also a strong symbol representing the integrity of that debt, uh, met both the needs of the state constantly at war, and also the needs of those people who used that debt for a whole variety of purposes, including the disposal of their savings, mm -hmm. the provision of nest eggs, the provision of retirement funds, the provision of dowries and legacies, all of these uh, 
provisions were made by the debt that was available um, and was managed by the bank. A sound national debt also created a virtuous circle as that debt went on to mobilise resources for the waging of wars, which sought to protect existing markets and to claim new ones. These markets then in turn yielded the fiscal and financial returns which supported the state. The bank, I think, remained at the centre of that process and operated, as I've said, not just a manager of that debt, but as a symbol of the integrity of public credit. And it was that role that I would argue that was perhaps its most crucial. <laughs>